last week that there's different ways to study. Uh, let's review and see if you paid attention. If you're brave enough to raise your hand and answer or not. Uh, can anybody remember there was three primary methods of Bible study? Uh, Miss Gail? Good job. Good job, Miss Gail. You took notes. There you go. That was bad. It's amazing. My insurance manager used to tell us that black and white ink and paper don't ever begin. So you have topical, as you said. What was the others? First by verse. First by verse, expository, yeah. And Bible. Can't hear you. Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So today we're going to look at a few minutes of inside of those three kind of studies. Um, what are even some ones inside of those? And uh, as a pastor, uh, as a pastor, we try to do all of them. Uh, we try, but I do preach primarily expositorily, verse by verse. I'm, I'm not real big on teaching, preaching subjects. Uh, I do preach some, but uh, I primarily like to take a passage and go verse by verse and teach and preach it that way. But he said here in this book a couple of good things. He said, what are some things to decide when you want to study a book of the Bible? I believe that's a I believe studying a book of the Bible is a wonderful, wonderful way to study the Bible. It's, it's probably, uh, I've probably used it as much as anything through the years as a pastor. It's where you start in a book, chapter 1, verse 1, you study all the way to the ending of it, and uh, in between, it, it's verse by verse written. It, put it under anything, it would be under verse by verse or expository study. That's what you're going to do. But when you study a book of the Bible, you ask yourself a number of questions. Uh, like when Paul in Galatians is talking about works and law, Paul was dealing then with Simon Peter and some of the Jews because they were kind of tacking on things, you know, got to do this plus this and you got to receive Christ plus do the things of Judaism. So Paul dealt with that in Galatians 2. So when you know the history of a book and when you know you know who wrote it, uh, when did they write it, who did they write it to primarily, and why did they write it, then as you're reading that book as you're studying that book, it really uh, makes more sense to you and you pick up things that you wouldn't normally pick up because, I mean, like Philippians, I love the book of Philippians uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, every chapter seems to be really full uh, of really good stuff. But you got to also know the relationship that Paul had with the Philippians. Uh, about every theologian or every commentary says that Paul's relationship to the church at Philippi that they were his favorite church and probably the best church. Uh, if you look in chapter in, in Philippians, you don't see him rebuking them anywhere. Really. You don't really see him calling them out. You don't really, I mean Corinthians was probably the worst church. Um, and he wrote two books to them and rebuked them and rebuffed them a number of ways. But in Philippians, you can tell that the Philippians and the Apostle Paul had a real good, close relationship because of the stuff of the letter. And then when you know that the Philippians were uh, some Gentile and some Jews, you, you get the idea that it's not like Galatians which was mostly Jews, uh, Ephesians, which was mostly Jews. So these are just things that you'll learn if you're studying the Bible by a book. He gives some advice here on that. He said, number one, of course, choosing a book is the first thing. And then the question is, how do you choose what book to study? Well, I mean, 
how you choose what to read. I mean, there's no, I mean, there's no real thing on you must study Romans first or you must study Philippians first. I mean, you study any book of the Bible you want to. Now, my suggestion as a pastor is I've been saved now since 1972 and I've been preaching since 1973 and the best I can figure out I've preached, I mean, like 5,000 sermons or whatever. And uh, there are some books that I would advise you if you were going to study books of the Bible and I'll just be honest with you, I, I wouldn't, I'd tell you not to start in Leviticus, okay? I mean, just to be honest with you, Leviticus is a great book, they all are, but it's a pretty hard book, and it's, uh, Lord, don't strike me dead, uh, a little boring with the details and the feast and all of that, but they're important, they're good. Uh, when I was in Bible college, I walked into a class called Studying Your Bible, or Bible Study. We had it for two years. I had it for four semesters. The guy that taught it is the one I didn't like, and it was mutual. He didn't like me. But he ended up challenging me to study a lot, and probably ended up being the best teacher I had, and I still didn't like him. But I remember the first day we walked in, talked about what books of the Bible to study first. One guy asked him, he said, what are some books of the Bible you would suggest somebody study? And I never forget what he said, and I agree with him. I didn't end that like him, but uh, I think he's right. Uh, he suggested start in 1 John. Because 1 John you know, 1 John was a book written by the Apostle John. And let's face it, Peter did more, and Peter walked on water, and Peter preached to thousands of people on Pentecost. But John was the best disciple. As far as faithfulness, as far as following the Lord, as far as having the trust of the Lord. And, and you even saw it the one time they're together. And Peter wanted to know something from Jesus. You remember the story? Well, what did he do? He asked Peter. He asked John. He said, hey, you're in his lap. He's loving on you. You ask him. So John had a great relationship with the Lord. And the book of 1 John is really about assurance of salvation. You know, not how to get saved, but that you are saved. And then I think the most important, I've been asked this many times, uh, I'll ask you the question, see what you're after, John. They're all important. I mean, all 66 books, so don't nobody give me the answer, they're all important. I know they're all important, okay? They're all supernatural. They're all written by God. So we need all of them. But if you could only read and study one book of the Bible. If you were put on an island or whatever, they said you have only one book of the Bible. What do you think that should be? Let me get some answers. Just give me an idea. I don't know what you think. Anybody? Romans. Huh? Romans. Romans? Romans. Romans. Good answer. Real good. Uh, anybody else? Not everybody at one time. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. Give me one. You're not getting points. You're not failing the test. I quit school a long time ago. Anybody else have a book of the Bible you think? You could only have the one book, it's the one you'd want to have. Nobody else different? Well, I think he picked the best one. And, and I'll tell you why. They, again, they taught us in college. Romans is a doctrinal book. Romans has every, basically every major doctrine 
of the Christian faith is dealt with in the book of Romans. Uh, so theologically and doctrinally, it's the richest book. Secondly, it's a very practical book. It doesn't just give you the doctrine and the theology. It tells you how to do it. It gives you the, not just the skeleton, but it puts the meat on the bones. So Romans would be my pick, probably. Um, let's see if somebody's going to try to help me here. Uh, what would be your second one, or what would be a different one than Romans? Somebody just give me another book of the Bible that if you were on an island or if you were somewhere, you couldn't have the whole Bible, you could have this one book. Anybody got a different answer? not do good in class with my Bible professor type thing. You will fail. Brother Jim. John. Gospel of John. That would be a real good one. Yeah, it's my it's my favorite gospel. It's uh have you ever heard the phrase synoptic gospels? Synoptic gospels is Matthew, Mark, and Luke and why they're called synoptic. They have a lot of the miracles and a lot of the same stuff in them. John doesn't really. Otherwise, Jesus, Jesus performed 33 miracles, and John only lists eight of them. Um, Luke lists like 20. Matthew lists like 21. Mark lists like 19. Uh, Jesus, John didn't have as many miracles as the other did, but he had some personal stuff and some deeper stuff uh, because I believe again him and Christ were I believe they were the highest of the apostles uh, matter of fact the Bible calls him the beloved disciple he's the only one that calls that John would be a good one anybody else Proverbs what Proverbs. Proverbs. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. You uh Charles Spurgeon made the famous statement that I've quoted about five hundred times, you heard it. He, he said, if you want to get the heart of God, you read the book of Psalms. If you want to get the mind of God, you read the book of Proverbs. I try to read a proverb every day. I I don't do it every day, but most days I do. And uh they say a good way to do that, and I've done it before, is read a proverb on the day of the month. If it's the 14th of March, then read Proverbs 14. Now you run into trouble with February, because uh, 28 days, 31 Proverbs, so you just double down a couple there. Proverbs is good. I think my second favorite one would probably be the book of Psalms. I love Psalms. Psalms has uh, got so much worship, so much about suffering, so much about how, how much God cares about us and loves us. Uh, I, read, I do read Psalms every day. I, I probably have only missed two or three days in 20 years at least reading one Psalm. Uh, I try to do that. Uh, before we go on, any other said Romans, Psalms, Proverbs, Gospel of John, 1 John. Uh, anybody else? How about an Old Testament one besides Psalms or Proverbs? What is, a, what is an Old Testament book that you really like a lot? Brother Jim. Genesis. Genesis. Yeah. Great choice. Yeah. They say if you don't get if you don't get the first 11 chapters of Genesis right, if you miss or mess up the first 11 chapters of Genesis, that you will be doctrinally wrong in other places. Because the first 11 chapters of Genesis does a lot of the foundation that everything is built. I love the book of Genesis. I, I, 
my favorite part in it is Joseph part, like 37 to 50. Uh, I love the story of Joseph. I really do. So anyway, you pick a book out, and that's up to you. Uh, it may you may pick a, pick a book out what you're going through in life. I mean, if you're going through some suffering, if you're going through some hard times, uh, probably Psalms. Uh, if you're having some doubts, and First uh, John will be good uh, for the Christian life, for the living, the practical Christian life. The Book of Romans would be the best one. Like it says, it said you choose a book. And he said, you select, you select a book that is practical for today. Again, and I'm not stopping you if you do. You can go study Leviticus or Ecclesiastes, and that, it's all good, but you kind of want to pick something that's for our day. When you look at a book, he recommends, and I agree with him, let's say you're studying the book of Romans. He said you should read the book about 12 times, 10 or 12 times. Otherwise, just start off maybe reading Romans 16 chapters. Uh, if you read, I mean, five a day, you could read it in three days. If you read it 10 times, that's 30 days. So for 30 days, you'd read the book of Romans. He said do that to get yourself real familiar with the terms, the phrases, the words, the author's writing ability. Then he says the following things you're going to want to find out about every book. The author, you know, who wrote the book. I mean, you can see with Paul. Paul was raised as a Jew, very educated, uh, a member of the Sanhedrin. His writings are more proper, more deeper, probably. Peter was a fisherman, common common man. And when you read his book, it's great, but it's different than Paul's writing. What were the circumstances when the author wrote the book? Hey, Miss Angelina. Um, why did, why was the book written? Of course, you can find this all out in those books I told you to get to study with. Who was the book written to? Uh, not just not just why it was written, who was it written to? Uh, where was it written? Uh, anybody know where the book of Philippians was written? Where was Paul at when the book of Philippians was written? Anyone? He's in prison, I think. He's in prison, yes ma'am. He was in the Philippian prison, and that's another reason why it's such a great book because he talks about joy and rejoicing and being content and I can do all things and he's down there and, and by the way church class uh, their prisons wasn't like ours they didn't have air conditioning TVs uh, and I just asked for me apart I don't want to be in jail but these prisons he was in were dungeons they were literally dark cold Dungeons, and that's where he was at when the Book of Philippians was written. Uh, when did it? When did Arthur write it? I mean, you know, when, when your minor prophets. When were they written? When did when Hosea wrote Hosea? What was going on in Israel? What 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 part of history was it? So, some of his phrases, some of his words that he uses, you'll understand more if you know that. Uh, what was a major problem? Otherwise, what was the author primarily dealing with? I, I mean, uh, the Corinthian church, it's obvious. He was dealing with immorality a lot in the Corinthian church. He dealt with a lot of things about being married and fornication and adultery and, and uh, incest and stuff like that. So that was going on in that church. And then what solutions were given? What did you what did you get out of the book after you studied it that gave you solutions to these problems? These are just simple things, and I promise you I'm going to do it this week if I have to go to UPS store 
We don't have a secretary anymore, so it's not like it used to be where I could just say, hey, print these off, you know. But I will get you the notes by next week. Uh, I will. He says next, he says uh, outline the book. Otherwise, look at the book as a whole, and it'll be broken up into sections. It'll be broken up into uh, thoughts, uh, subjects, and learn to divide. Like Philippians, I'm looking at study right now. Philippians 1 is really the introduction. Philippians 2, he deals with our relationships with people. Philippians 3, he deals with knowing Christ and, and being crucified and all of that. And then chapter 4 is the joy chapter. It's about rejoicing. I can do all things. So you, you need to learn how to outline the book uh, after you read it 10 or 12 times. And uh, second type of study I'm going to hit real quick here is studying a chapter of the Bible at a time. We just talked about a book of the Bible at a time. Now we're going to talk about just taking a chapter out and studying the chapter, uh, one chapter at a time. And uh, it's going to be similar to some of the book stuff because you're going to want to know who wrote it, why, uh, what's being addressed, Who's, you know, what's going on when it's written. Uh, but in a chapter study, you, you go a little deeper than a book study. You take one chapter, like I could take Philippians. It'd be real easy for me. Uh, let me ask this question. I'm trying to get an answer out of you. Uh, what is, if you had one chapter, that'd be your favorite chapter in the Bible. What would you say that is? What is your favorite chapter of the Bible? Think about it a minute. Uh, if you had just one chapter you could read, you know, and study, maybe you listen to teaching or preaching on, what would that chapter be? Well, Jim, you're participating. I'm giving you a, we're going to have a gold star for you. Yes, sir. Romans 10. Romans 10, that's awesome. Uh, thou shalt confess to thy mouth and Whosoever shall call upon me the Lord. That's, that's, a, that's, that's one of my favorite chapters. Absolutely. Anyone else have a chapter that you like? Uh, yeah. Anybody else? I'm going to give you mine while you're thinking. Brother Jim, give me another one. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 about the prophecy of Christ. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, you can take that and lead it to Christ. Without, without the New Testament. Okay? Yeah. It's called the Gospel in Isaiah. Yeah. My favorite chapter would be Philippians 4. Probably already showed that. I just love that chapter so much. Uh, it's so rich, so much stuff in it that I enjoy and preach and teach all of Anyone else? Anyone else have one? Give you another one of mine. Corinthians 13. Ma'am? Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Yes. About love, yes. charity. Yes, ma'am. That's that's a, that's a really good one. That's really, uh, and they're all good. 1 Corinthians 13. About love, because charity is love in action. It's an excellent chapter. I, I've used it, quoted it, preached it, taught it a bunch of times. Yeah. Anyone else where we go on? When you look at a chapter, some things you ask are what is the main subject of the chapter. By the way, a chapter, don't, don't, don't be fooled that I'm studying chapter 2 and the whole chapter will be about one subject. It can be divided. Uh, it, the first six verses might be on one subject and the last nine verses might be on another subject. You want to try to find out what is the main subject in a chapter. Who are the main people it's written to? What does it have to say specifically about Christ? 
Here's something they taught us in college. Find the key or main verse of a chapter. Like when I think of chapters, I think of Matthew 6. The first verse comes to my mind is verse 33. The seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then when I think about the Jim said Romans 10, the, the main verse to me would be, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, when I think of Ephesians 2, I think of the verse, For by grace you are saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So when you look at a chapter, try to pick out a key main verse that that helps you remember that chapter and everything there. Uh, what is the central lesson of that chapter? What is it really trying to say? Uh, what are the main commands in the chapter? What are the things that God says out of it? that you should be commanded or challenged. Uh, what era should I live on? You know, we know this, don't we? There are two ways to learn. I, I mean, I'm really trying to help Brother Jesse. I'm spending time here at the church with him, and, and he's 30 years old, and I'm 66, and, you know, I think Brother Jesse's a great guy, and I believe he's the right man for this church. And, and one thing I like about him is he's very teachable. He's not arrogant. He participates in our discussions with me and him have. Uh, he asks me questions. He wants to know what I think. He wants to know what I would do. Sometimes now, I don't even tell him because I'm scared if I tell him, he'll make that decision and I want him to make his own decision. Uh, I'll just give him some pros and cons say, well, you know, I've done both, and here are the good things, and here are the bad things, uh, you know. But being teachable and learning, you learn by, you learn by what to do, and you learn what not to do. So I think in my position as Pastor Emeritus, and I ain't bragging on me, that ain't me at all. Jesse said this the other day, not many young pastors get to have a pastor emeritus that they want to work with, and he wants to work with them. Um, I have some friends that are pastor around. They're great guys, but they don't stay at the church. They go off and preach a lot, and this or that. And I, I kind of talked about that a little bit. That's why Jesse wanted me to do it. He don't want me to. But I tell him a lot of times, I kind of say in private, um, I don't know if you should do that or not. Let's, let's uh, think about that. So what to do is one way to learn, and what not to do is uh, How many of you would say, I, I think I would say this personally, how many of you if I raise a hand to say, probably in life I have learned better and more stuff by what not to do? See, I, I would be in that category. Um, I, done about six million fruitless, ignorant things and had to pay for them. But anyway, the chapter, you want to find out the errors you can avoid. You want to find out the main thing the chapter's saying. Uh, what out of the chapter could you apply today? I mean, here's the chapter and I've read it, I've studied it. So what application could I make to me? Those are things that you, uh, and what I'll do, and I know I've said this three weeks in a row, but I promise you I will. Uh, I've got a chapter analysis here, real simple, that I'm going to make you some copies of, and it'll really help you if you were doing a, a chapter study. It asks the question, what is the main subject? You answer it. Uh, what does it say about Christ? You answer it. So I'll get these to you, the Lord willing, by next Sunday. Uh, so we study by the books of the Bible, we study by the chapters of the Bible, we study by the subjects and topics of the Bible, uh, and then we study the Bible as a whole. Uh, I, I don't want to confuse you because all these are studying the Bible, but we look at the Bible and you figure out as a whole how it's set up and how it relates.
saints and how it ties together and how it helps people. And you, you go that way. Uh, I mean, I believe, okay, I am not a, I don't want to get too deep into this right now, but I am not a hyper dispensation. Say, so tell me what that means. A hyper dispensationalist of the Bible, an ultra dispensationalist, believes that there are times that God dealt with man and differently, and that man was saved differently. Other one, let me show you illustration. They really, a hyper or ultra dispensationalist, believes that a person in the Old Testament was saved by keeping the sacrifices, by doing the laws of Judaism. And what Moses and them commanded them to do. Okay, we don't believe that. We believe they should have obeyed it. We believe it's a picture of salvation. It's representative of the blood of Christ. But I believe man is always saved by grace. How I many of you do? By grace. Okay, he is never saved. Man is never saved by works. Even in the tribulation where it talked about they won't take the mark of the beast and, and, and there'll be many of them. That's not saving them. They're not taking the mark of the beast because they believe in Christ. And by faith, they believe in him. So the whole Bible to me is a book that is by grace through faith. Okay? And you need to understand that when you see certain passages. I mean, you see certain books, and it might even, I mean, be honest with you now, I mean, I'd like to tell you that, I mean, I've been studying the Bible really for a living. You've paid me really for 22 years also to study the Bible, and I study it hours and hours and hours, and I know a lot. I mean, I know a lot more than the average person does. Uh, I'm not an expert. I'm not, I'm not a genius or nothing. Uh, there are a lot people that know more about the Bible. I wouldn't be in the upper echelon of theologians in the world, but I know a good bit about it because I've studied it for 40-something years. And I, but that don't mean you can't know much about it either. Uh, you haven't got to be a pastor. You haven't got to go to Bible college. You haven't got to go to seminary. Uh, you can learn a lot about the Bible as a layman or a laywoman. And if you apply these things, uh, the Bible can be real to you. But you need to have an overall understanding. Uh, I'm going to buy, I didn't do this early enough, but I found a place I can buy a little book by C.I. Schofield. A lot of you are familiar with the Schofield Bible, right? Okay. The guy that, the guy that compiled the Schofield Bible was a guy named C.I. Schofield. Uh, Presbyterian, pastor, solid doctrinally overall. We have some disagreements, but overall solid. But he wrote a little book, a little book that you can read probably in one setting called Rightly Dividing the Word. He takes the whole Bible, kind of breaks it down into sections like we kind of did a couple of weeks ago. I'd recommend everybody get one. I'm going I'm to get some for you. If you want one, I can get them for like five bucks a piece or whatever. And uh, so anyway, uh, we'll do that, okay? Now, we got about two minutes, and I'm really, you know, uh, we could have had a better crowd today like we did last week. We had a really good crowd last week. But uh, I think I'm going to stop there. I could really teach some more. Uh, I could go about some. Bible study. I have left one tool out that you might want to think about getting. Uh, they have some books called Bible Handbooks. The best one is a Haley's Handbook. Now what a handbook does is a little different than a concordance or a dictionary. It's going to give you some of the customs of the day. Uh, like I'll be honest with you, it would be very interesting for you to study a Jewish wedding. A Jewish wedding, and I've been to it in person, a Jewish wedding is really beautiful. And the reason it's beautiful is because it's a picture of Christ and the church and God the Father and Israel. 
getting married. So the little handbook would tell you, you know, exactly how their customs were. And so I would I would advise you to get they're they're cheap. You can get them online for six, seven dollars. Uh, Haley's Bible handbook. Uh, and it'll give you some of the customs, some of the things today. Anybody got a question before we uh, take up our mission? All for remember we started last Sunday. Uh, bring a little extra money. I talked to Mother Jesse, yeah. talked to Miss Cindy and them, and I told them to we'll put the money in an envelope. It's going to go toward a missionary, and we're going directly, as an adult class, we're going to uh, sponsor a missionary. And if we bring, I mean, if we take that $25 a week, that will allow us to support a missionary for $100 a month, which is full of support for a missionary. And uh, so, uh, if you Brother Mike come ahead and just, if you got some money, let Brother Mike know and he'll get it from you. I've got some up here, uh, if you will. I mean, I, I really hope this thing, honestly, class, I, I won't deny it. We, we're down today in attendance, but uh, I really hope this will grow before we can support two or three missions. I hope I hope we bring in enough to some more support for one missionary. We're going to take this money up for a few weeks and probably maybe I talked to Miss Cindy. We're going to probably see what we've got uh, the first of April, and we're going to cut a check and send it to a missionary. You know? And then, but I'm hoping I just I'd like to tell you that we're going to take up enough to support two or three missionaries. I think. Got to get the class. We did better at almost 20 last week. I don't know where some of the regulars are today. Uh, but mention it to some people. Are you enjoying Sunday school? I mean, am I a terrible teacher? Am I okay? Or so so? You know? Okay. Well, let's stand forward to prayer. We'll be dismissed. And then Brother Jesse, please do pray for my shoulder. Just really, it's really challenging right now. It'll be a challenge. Pray for my son. Uh, he's looking, he told me yesterday, we're out of state together for a while. He's got a good job as a manager of the bank, but he really, they're not paying him as good as he should. He's got an offer to deal with another bank. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for a good day. Thank you for a good class. Thank you for a good lesson. Thank you for a wonderful book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.